Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. My work as a landscape architect, um, I've spent all my life working on historic landscapes, not necessarily to do with their accurate restoration, but very often to do with accommodating development and change and new build and so on in, in historic landscapes. And I've noticed one particular phenomenon. And what I want to do this evening is talk, tell you what this problem is, talk through uh, how people responded to it, um, and then prove that it really is a problem at the end. So the snag is that you are going to have to believe that there is a problem, although it seems most unlikely that there is a problem, okay? So you're just going to have to bear with me. That was all very complicated. The problem itself is easily expressed. If I go on one. This is, this is France, by the way, not, not Britain. Um, the problem is I call the front door problem, okay? And it, it's, maybe it's a particularly problem for England. If you design a classical house, Baroque house, a Palladian house, it tends to be symmetrical, does it not? And in the middle, one would put the front door, okay? Is that, are you with me so far? And if you're trying to design a landscape to go with a classical house, you're going to, the instinct is going to make, to be to make it kind of symmetrical about the front door so that the, land, so that the house sits nicely in the landscape. And um, this, of course, is what happens at Versailles. We're now at the far end of the Grand Canal, and the house is so far away, the palace, I should say, is so far away you can't see it, but you get a sense of the vast scale of the canal from these little people here. And um, this sounds all very well, but the front door problem in England is that if you're going to see the wonderful view from the front door, you have to have the front door open. If the front door is open in England, the wind is going to be roaring into the house, you're going to get covered with rain, soaked with rain, in short, there's a problem, okay? So that's the problem I want to present to you. Then I want to show you how architecture <laughs> seems to me to have tried to deal with the problem. And then at the end, I want to show you that there really is a problem, all right? There that there was really perceived to be a problem. But so you've got the general shape of things as I propose to unfold them. Yeah, so, so like, um, I'm not at all anti-French, but the fact is, for the last thousand years or so, most of Britain's problems have come from France. And, <laughs> and, and the front door problem is, is one of those. Uh, so yeah, this is the Swiss lake. Enormous alleys, enormous vistas at Versailles running up to the house. And this, um, the, the front door problem, as it were, comes, is in England as well. So this is rest which is a Capability Brown Park, but this, this is an earlier design from 1714 by Thomas Archer, and the photograph is taken from the house, so there's the long canal running down to the pavilion. So the problem existed in England, and here's a Wimpole, another Capability Brown landscape, with a huge avenue, three and a half miles long, um, made by Charles Bridgman, but again inherited and, in, and retained by Brown. Ah, now here, I should pause again. Um, I'm mostly going to be talking about two English designers. Um, Lancelot, cap known as Capability Brown, Capability Brown, 1716 to 1783, and his successor, uh, Humphrey Repton, um, 1752 to 1818. So, so he starts work in 1788, five years after Brown dies. He realizes there's a gap in the market. And the, the odd thing about Repton, just to mention him now, um, um, is that he's hugely influential on American design, hugely influential, and yet, I think, completely forgotten in America. So influential that when the Association of Landscape Architects in America was founded in Boston by the Olmsted brothers and others. Uh, it was called the Repton Club. And the first book they published was an edited version of Repton's works. And 
I'll come back to that, but it's, it's an odd phenomenon that Repton, Humphrey Repton has been forgotten. I think a lot of the trouble is that he was called Humphrey. <laughs> Rather, capability has more of a ring to it, I think. It's more, slightly more memorable. At any rate, I will be reverting to Repton as, as, as we go along. But the, <coughs> one of Brown's earliest works, 1747, is Wooten House, where some of you I know have visited and where Julie and I got married. Um, and I've, I've been working there for about 30 years. And here you see Brown trying to, um, at a very early stage, falling into the front, front door problem trap because there already was this avenue running out from the house. But if you can bear reversion to a map briefly, there's the house. And Brown actually added these extra um, a statue of Mars, an urn, statue of Jupiter, and a view to Chiltern Hill, which is where the family, the, old, the, fam the farm, it's a great big medieval building that the family had come from up on the hill. But the problem with that was that you only get this view absolutely stand of, of the five vistas running off if you're absolutely standing on the threshold of the house. You have to have the front door open to see the view. And as soon as you move forward just a yard, it, it's gone, you know. So as a piece of design, it looks great on paper, but in real life, it's, it's a non-starter. It doesn't work. Uh, so a first solution to the problem, Brown came up with at another landscape he was working at at the same time, Croom Court. He started a couple of years later. Here again, you, this is National Trust now, some of you may have been, and here, ignore these clumsy drawings, but here's the house, and again, you've got buildings set out more or less formally around the house. But, but what he does, he, he designs the house here. And so the first thing, first solution is to put a portico onto the house. So here's the first great architectural solution. And the portico in, it's obviously a Greek idea in origin, um, but it was, it was a very handy thing to have on the entrance front of a house so that the, the, the butler, think Downton Abbey, you know, the butler would come out to welcome the guests and would be sheltered from the rain when, when he lets them into the house. But this is not on the entrance front, this is on the back front, and this portico area was called, in, at Croom, was called the pavilion. And it used to be equipped with tents, canvas, sorry, I'm not, canvas screens and so on. And they would sit out here on the, on the portico, which meant that the front door could be kept closed and they would sit in, in front of it. So I hope you're getting a sense of what I'm trying to do, which is to take ordinary tropes of classical architecture and show how they might be used and might have been adopted to solve a, a very practical problem. Brown also puts this bay on here, and I'll, I'll come back to that. But to my mind, it's a really, I mean, I hate to say it, Brown is a titanic figure in the world of landscape, but he was a lousy architect. And so here, this is, so here's a Repton, and some of you will know, Repton produced these red books, these books of designs which show the landscape as it is, and then you peel back a paper flap and you see it um, as he's going to make it. And that's, if I, that's rather nice because that's the existing view and he is going to turn the portico into a kind of outside room with a railing, a carpet, um, and the, the ladies are perfectly content and the railing keeps the deer and cattle and things from coming up to it. So this is the... the the portico becoming an idea, a means of, of enabling you to enjoy the view without ha having to have the, the front door open. Uh, yeah, okay, so this is another Repton. This is Mogger Hanger working with Sir John Soane, um, the most severe, austere neoclassicist architect. He didn't get on with Repton. But it's a very bizarre looking house and I want you to look at the, see the veranda in the front. This is Repton's proposal, 1798. Here's his, the existing house. These are the, these are the tongues of the flap that you peel back to see the, his first idea for the veranda. And what this awkward 
photograph here. I'll shortly explain to you. But you can see the veranda is intercolumniated. In other words, the windows fit between the, between the thing. But if you, if you stand right in the middle of the house, and this photograph is taken from this point, at a very early stage in the, in the work we did on reconstructing the house and the landscape. So these are all means of keeping the local um, lads from, from destroying the house. But behind every upright of the veranda is a tree. Do you see this? A, that's a, a stump regrowing from a tree, a copper beech. I'll come back to that one. There's a stump, another stump there, and then the cedar behind that one. So what you're seeing there is that the portico is becoming the means of creating out of a panorama, which is this great long view, it's creating a whole series of vignettes. And a vignette was a kind of technical term for a picture without a frame at the, at the time. It meant a picture without a frame. So you had these columns, but then the, the line of the column is softened by the tree behind. The leaves of the trees conceal the column. So you're starting to see how seriously people are thinking about columns and verandas. This is 1798. And the design is much cleverer than it looks. It, it, it was clever enough for, until I pointed it out, no one had noticed this. Because the trees are standing on a ha-ha. Um, a ha-ha is a hidden fence. You know what a ha-ha is, perhaps? Um, but the ha-ha is not square onto the house. So the trees are not in any way in a regular at regular intervals down the ha-ha because it's not square onto the house. So you get this quite intricate geometry. Um, and then once you've started thinking about um, porticos you can really, uh, and columns, you can really start having fun. So this is a favorite one, the Temple of Friendship at Hestacum. And at this point, the whole design, architectural design, is being determined by the setting because what this is, is a, it's basically a very simple box with a couple of columns in front, okay? But if you sit, and there, there are benches around the back of the box. If you sit in the, in the back, looking between the columns, you see one view. If you sit, one designed view. If you sit on the left-hand side, you see another. If you sit on the right-hand side, you see another. Going on from here, the central view is down the, the pear pond, it's called. This is the octagon uh, seat. And, w <coughs> and there, there are now views out into the Vale of Taunton, great long distant views. If you sit on the left-hand side, you see the cascade uh, of water. And if you sit on the right-hand side, you see the witch house. So this was called the Temple of Friendship. But you can't help imagining the three friends sitting, one on each seat, having the most wonderful kind of surreal discussion about what they were looking at because they were all looking at completely different scenes. And this is a, a, um, a mel merging together of landscape and architecture. And, the, and so clearly, if the box was any deeper, you wouldn't get the same effect. The, the box, the columns, everything is worked in order to bring off this idea. This, <clears throat> as soon as you start with a piece of paper and pencil, thinking about the relationship between buildings and columns and how you see out, there are umpteen variants on it, on, on how you can play with it. And I'm not going to go through all of them. That's just a, well, I, I couldn't. But that, I, mean, I don't know them all. I've never really thought about it. But, uh, I, <coughs> sorry, I take that back. I have thought very deeply. <laughs> I have spent many months thinking about little else. Um, so uh, the next solution to the, to the front door problem, we're staying with the front door problem, is obviously the bay. Putting a bay on the front door so that your views are out to left and right and you can block a view straight in front. And this is wrapped and it's clearly a little folly, but there's the, the door is shut, but the views are out to left and right of the bay. And so you're starting to get, so you're, return, you're retaining the symmetry of the building, yeah? But you're actually avoiding the front door problem. Your views are out to each side. Um, and uh, <coughs> here's uh, Newton Park by Stiff Leadbeater, um, 1740s, a Brown and Repton both worked here. And um, the, the, uh, 
the views. This, this view takes you to the old castle, and this view takes you to Brown's Lake, and this view doesn't take you anywhere at all. It's just, it's a dud. Um, the next thing is that you, what you can do is put the, uh, your, readopt the piano nobile, and you probably know that in, in the 18th century in England, the tendency was to want to bring the main rooms down to ground level, and uh, there are many dis discussions about why this happened. Marc Girouard, who you may have come across, uh, he has one idea. Repton himself had another idea that it was by bringing the views down, bringing the rooms down, you give the, yourself much more control over the landscape. The higher up you are, the less you can control what you see. You're just seeing vast spaces, as it were. But if you're down at the ground level, you can control the composition of the landscape very carefully. So that was one factor. Nonetheless, retaining the Piano Nobile or gallery, which Brown does at Corsham and Burton Constable and stuff, and as happens here at Clandon, which is a Palladian villa of 1731, um, is one solution. And I put Clandon up because people, in 1877, they tried to um, sort out the problem in another way. And, and this picture, they, they sorted it out by raising the earth up in the front and putting on this dreadful port corchere. And these are the old stairs, and they pushed them forward here. And this was the en entry, really, down here. You can see the cars are still there. But th this monster has been put in in the front. Um, but in principle, you went in there, and you went upstairs, and this was the grand room with the views out. So, so you, avoided, you avoided the open door problem by simply having your main rooms one floor up. So another solution. And you can even, here's Packington. This is the, um, the view towards the, the water. <coughs> Obviously, if you put your portico upstairs as well, you've got, your, your, you've got it's a belt and braces job. You're, completely covered for it. Um, oh, well, here, yes, now here's a picture which rather shows, this is Mochus on the River Wye in, in Herefordshire, a river famed in the 18th century and still today for its beauty. Um, and here, here's the house by Keck, and uh, the bay faces out this way. And the point about this picture and the importance of the bay which is really effective here because the, the river is on a kind of bend and the house is on the bend. So by looking obliquely, you get these long reaches of water. And the, the, the essential underlying point is that almost without thinking about it, people tended to build houses on the, on the, on the top of a slope with the valley falling down to the water in the bottom. And I think partly for drainage reasons, and you could bring water into the house, you could drain the water away quite well. And the houses, if you think about English houses, again and again, they're built square onto the slope. Okay, they're built, they're parallel to the slope, if you got me? Just, just, just like here. The snag about that is that the view straight out is going to be straight across the narrowest bit of water. And you don't want narrow bits of water, you want great long reaches. And so it's another reason for being concerned about the classical symmetrical house and the view out. If the house is put on the top of a hill, square onto the, square onto the valley, it's inevitably, the view straight out is not going to work. Um, so here at Mocus, um, Rep Brown works, and then Repton comes along after. And Repton, in many ways, doesn't really get it. And he actually writes in one of his books about Mocus. He says how easy it was by removing a few barrows of earth to show off a view of the river. In other words, Brown had a bank so that, so that from the house itself you couldn't see the river straight in front. And Repton thought it'd be very clever to take it away and show the river. And he kind of slightly missed the point that Brown was aiming for you not to see the river in, in front. But, it's, an, it's another aspect of the front door problem, if you see what I mean, that you have to try and spread the view away from the house. Um, this is um, Henningham in Suffolk. The house, is, the house is here looking down over, um, over the, the lakes, which are by brown. It's a huge brown landscape, late 
great brown landscape. And here's, this is a rather poor picture in the rain, but here is the great house facing straight out. And a great enfilade of rooms running, down, running along the front. So, so what you get, so another brilliant solution, and this is the first example of it, I think, by Capability Brown, but Repton gets very into it, is all you have to do is turn the house at 45 degrees to the slope and suddenly the whole problem is removed. Um, so here's the, here's the lake, clearly. And amazingly, um, although from the, from the lake the house is so prominent, if you're in the house, you can't see the lake. It's, it's, it's incredible. And, and when I, it was really interesting because when I was working there, I said to the staff, well, where's, where can I see the lake from the house? And they all thought you could see the lake, and they were sort of going from room to room because it was so clear in their minds that there was this relationship. But in fact, these two windows here are the library windows and we're always blind. We've got the original plans and they were always pretend windows, you know. Um, so you couldn't see the lake. But this turning of the house to an angle, uh, retaining its classical form but turning it to an angle, is, a, is an amazing way to, to sort of liberate your thinking about landscape and the relationship with the, with the landscape. Um, another alternative is to, um, this, is, this is Burley House, Elizabethan show house, built by the, the Cecils. And um, in essence, it has a regular classical form but there's so many spires and spikes and everything else on it that you, 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 you lose any sense of that. And um, once you get into the true um, sort of faux gothic of Beaver Castle 1810, something like that, 1815, you can see that, um, you know, it's, tell me where the front door is. When I first arrived here, it was about 10.30 one night, in the snow, and the Duchess had forgotten that I was coming. And so the whole place was locked up. And I went round and round and round trying to find a door that was remote, <laughs> remotely plausible as a door to go in by. I ended up having to uh, have my, ha my hand on the horn of the car, flashing the lights. And finally, the Duchess at the top, window at the top of the house, in her nighty, opens the window with the snow falling. Oh, Christ, John, I've forgotten you were coming. Anyway, my point is that if you do Gothic, if you, if you, if you move away from classical or, or simply this was a classical house, believe it or not, underneath this, if you simply smash the rules, as it were, it's another way of solving the whole front, front door problem. You have a front door wherever you like. And um, this is a, another place where I'm working at the moment. I put this up because it's such an amazing picture, because it's somehow... It must be a real picture, but I can hardly imagine it. So this is the Isle of Wight. This is Osborne House, Queen Victoria's house. This is Norris Castle, <laughs> and the Solent, which is the sea, is, is somewhere around about there in the bottom row of books. And this is an amazing farm complex here, which is part of Norris. But here again, um, there's a, at the heart of it, there's a symmetrical classical house, but with so much stuff banged onto it on either side. And the front door, or the door on this side, is actually there. So again, it completely liberates you by simply abandoning the classical tradition. The Gothic can do that. The Gothic has, of course, its own considerable snags. One is you have to be prepared to live in a castle, and that means you're going to be very damp and very cold most of the time. So, um, oh, and all, yes, and all, this is a sketch of Norris by um, George Stanley Repton, who's Humphrey's son. And you're also going to tend to be limited in what you can do by way of a setting around a Gothic castle, because you want it to look sort of wild and rough in order to be in keeping with the character of the castle. So I, I want to... Um, uh, this is going to appear like a little bit of a diversion, but this is, I'm now moving to the eventual and final telling solution of the front door problem, which is, which is the cottage. 
and cottage architecture. In uh, 1714, 1717 or so, this is built, which is at Stowe, Buckinghamshire, and Stowe is regarded as the most important, most influential garden in the English style that was made because everybody worked there. Um, and that, yes, this, this was the new inn where, where you came to stay when you were going to look round the gardens. It was a sort of very early hotel. But the actual front of the building that you see from the gardens is the back of the building. This is, this is really the front. This is because and next to it, in the, which you see from the gardens, are the blacksmith's shop and the blacksmith's uh, workshops and so on out the back because they were creating in 1714-17 uh, a kind of mock village. But it was a real village. It had a real blacksmith in it. It had real things going on. But it was deliberately looked, built to look like a village, whereas the rest of Stowe, of course, is wonderful classical temples and and so on, that, was, that, uh, that are one of the wonders of England, I think, today. But, so there was an idea about the cottage, and Brown, Capability Brown, who worked at Stowe for 10 years, he lived in the Boycott Pavilion, and he would look straight down the West Terrace for a mile and a half or something, and this village, this sort of mock village, village was at the far end. Um, and, of course, in France, this is 1770s, um, you get this idea of the village, the cottage, emerging, Marie Antoinette, Betty Trianon is famous for it. But these were pretend houses for the gentry to go and live in, and, and they were extremely ornamental inside. They're not, we can set them, that's France. We, we have to try and set France to one side. And, and nonetheless, there are cottage-like buildings. This is the Swiss cottage at Ensley in Kent which was clearly built for the pleasure of the, of the family. But I want to set those aside as well. And if you go to um, Blaise Hamlet, which amazingly is, is still completely intact and is more or less in the middle of Bristol. And it's so wonderful as a place. It's owned by the National Trust, but they never advertise it. They never encourage people to go because it's tiny and so precious and so amazing. And these houses are designed well, all the drawings are really by George Stanley Repton, who was working for John Nash, who was Humphrey Repton's partner. So. Um, but, but these were for workers. They're, they're wonderful buildings. They're nothing to do with classicism, I hope you'll, you'll agree. And um, this is the roundhouse. They're wonderful buildings, and it, almost immediately they became um, uh, hugely famous and celebrated, and everyone went, went to see them. But they missed a serious point, that they were for the workers, and you can't, and, and somehow it was uh, belittling the dignity of the workers to put them in cottages like this. Because if you lived in a cottage like this, even today if you lived in one, you might feel you had to have the right hat and gloves and clean apron just to go outside, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's trying to tell you that you should live in a certain kind of way. And it was, even in the, in the 1770s, this, it was felt to be, they were amazing buildings, but it was felt to be, uh, the word they used was affected, affected architecture. And so another alternative was to revert to the classical, if you like, this is Harwood in Yorkshire, where you put all your workers into these barracks. And the, um, uh, and Brown does the same at Newnham Courtney, just outside Oxford. And more famously, he does it at, at uh, Milton Abbas, where he, this is this village, the houses are designed by chambers. And it may be that Milton Abbas is the first architect designed village using entirely vernacular materials. It's thatch and cob, mud, mud and chalk and thatch. Um, and here it is today. It's extremely photogenic, wonderful, beautiful village with a wonderful, the, the main street is a wonderful S shape with the church at the bend, the perfect serpentine S winding up through the valley. It's a beautiful place to go. But fundamentally, these villages were no different from the early industrial villages, such as, as Cromford, where Arkwright 
had his mills, the beginning of milling and, and in industry in, in textiles. And um, I think my point is partly that agriculture was being seen, new agriculture, modern agriculture was coming in, the agricultural revolution had taken hold as being another form of industry. So these houses, these were going to be another form of industry. But again, it was felt that these were demeaning to the working man they, and woman. They were um, described at the time, Milton Abbas, the cottages, as places that, um, where it seemed everyone living there had, had seen better days. They'd all fallen on hard times because so clearly, if you live in a cottage like that, you are staff, you're working for the, for the uh, great owner, and to some extent it's the beginnings of the of the, the Downton Abbey hierarchy, where there's the Lord, someone or others at the top, and it, there's a hierarchy all the way down, rather than what had been the case, which was a confederacy of yeomen, all of whom were independent, and anyone could talk to Lord so-and-so if they happened to meet him in the street, because they, were all, they all had their own acre or two acres to play with. And Brown himself seems to have been aware of this. So, to an amazing degree, if you go to a brown landscape, you find that he saves at least one old cottage. And this one, Green Walk Cottage, is in the pleasure ground. It's very near the big house at Milton. And it, it, it's, it's just left. It's an ordinary cottage. It's, nothing's, it's cob and thatch again. But it's in the middle of the garden. And he does this again and again. And I still can't say I really understand what it's about. But it has something to do with some quality of the cottage. And, and here, um, having built this model village at Milton Abbas, he then eventually, at the end of his time at, at Milton Abbey, this is an ordinary village of Hilton, and he, he brings his woods right round the back, so that Hilton, the village, is brought into the park, just with its ordinary houses. So we see the same trend in Repton, where here's 1794, he, he has a farmhouse and he wants to make an entry to the big house. Wentworth Woodhouse is the biggest private house in, in England ever, ever made. In, it's a fantastic, enormous landscape in, in Yorkshire. And so in 1794, he's wanting to replace it with an arch and a sort of mini Harwood, you know, regular buildings, symmetrical buildings and so on. Um, and then um, by 76, He's taking a cottage and all he, he's leaving it pretty well, putting in a gable and putting in a trellis and leaving it. So suddenly the cottage is, is taking off as a form of architecture. And this, to some extent, this is the woodman's cottage at Blaze by Repton. Here's his red book showing the design and here's the cottage pretty much exactly as built. And this this was this, this was really became the model for cottages, and um, this was described as the, the natural style rather than the affected style. And many people wrote essays about this in England, um, about the need to provide housing that was not too grand, not because they didn't want to give people ideas, but because there must be a kind of housing that matches the ambitions and so on of the, of the yeoman, brings back the yeoman. So they had this, so part of their political character was the degree of irregular, irregularity they, they had. And um, well, when Olmsted came to England, you know, he studied, he came five or six times to England studying or on holiday or because he was about to get sacked from Central Park. Um, I don't need to tell you about that. Um, but he came to places like um, Stonely, which had all these, which is another Repton. These, the drawings are 1825, the cottages are earlier. Um, so he was seeing all these cottages, and, this, and, and they come up again and again. And of course, to some extent, the cottage is now starting to make its way up through society. So here's a, essentially Jane Austen's house, a classic house, you might think. But there's irregularity in the windows and so on. It's not quite right. And there's this lovely line in Persuasion where she's, if I, I have to read it out for you to kind of get the joke. It's often the way with but Jane Austen. But you see, 
Uppercross Cottage had received the improvement of a, f a farmhouse elevated into a cottage. You, you get what I, a farmhouse is actually much grander than a cottage, but a farmhouse is now being elevated into a cottage uh, with its veranda, French windows, and other prettinesses because the cottage has become, um, is becoming the fashion. And the cottage is not just the working man's house, but it's making its way up to the ranks and it will take over from the Gothic and the classical, as I shall show. So Repton again uh, in Stanage um, is proposing uh, to introduce something. He comes across in 1803, he comes across something and he, the manor house. He suddenly discovers the manor house, which may have these classical detailings, but it also accommodates, the Cotswolds is full of them, accommodates all sort of irregularities. And he's building this one. That's the existing house. Um, it's well worth your reading the bit on the bottom. Should the character of this house be thought, be thought too humble, a single turret would give importance. See sketch number 10. So, but this is before. Should, this is his house that's too humble. But it is, you can see that this is a manor house. You can see it's, they're the bones of, of architecture of all kinds, but it's very consciously been made completely irregular. And this is a kind of elaboration of the cottage form. And he, here it is, another view. And this time he's popped in the turret, just in case it wasn't quite grand enough before. Um, and here, here it is today, and his bit is this bit here, and then this got added later. But his, his bit all got, all got built, it just got modified. And um, the greatest of these cottages is, um, is Ensley. And this is the back door, and you see all these, um, it's completely irregular and a mishmash, but what it gives you is the front, where suddenly he's broken the mold with the front door problem, He's got different, the house at all sorts of different angles, each of which has a completely different view. So suddenly, by breaking all the rules and getting rid of classicism, getting rid of the Gothic, which was so limiting, in the cottage, and this was called Ensley Cottage, it's a modest 18 bedrooms, but um, a cottage, he, he's, he's liberating the form. And my, the point about this, is that while you can, you can whimsify it a little bit, this is Brown doing something vaguely similar at Woodstock, where he takes the town and propose, proposes to build a, a, a wall around it to make it look like an Italian town. Um, you, can, you can kind of whimsify it like that. Or this is another of my favorites. Um, this is Repton at Ston Easton. And here, he, he builds this wonderfully absurd folly. It's a bridge. In the middle of the bridge is um, a gate, but you can't even, you certainly a carriage drive. You can't get a carriage through conceivably because it's, it's running down the middle of this bridge. And here's the a cross to suggest to you that it's a Christian uh, monument, an ancient Christian monument, into which, into the ruins of which, this cottage has been built so that by putting the cottage and making it look old, it proves that the ruin must be a thousand years older than that. Do you see what I mean? It's, a, it's very jolly stuff, um, but it's kind of whimsical. And with it, with this development of the cottage, you get, this is Repton again, um, this is Repton's design for the cottage, showing what he thought was an appropriate cottage garden. So. But a cottage garden would actually have pigs, chickens, and, and a lot of old broken wheelbarrows and stuff in it. Um, but this, this idea of the cottage, the Tudor cottage with a kind of appropriate Tudor garden comes through with Repton. Um, and here it is at Ensley again, the, the parterre, and here's the parterre surviving today. I can't recommend Ensley too strongly. And the, the, the point about that is that, Rep, or one point about that is that Repton himself lived in a cottage. And I pop this in because this shows you how important Olmsted and Americans regarded Repton. No one in Repton's, even in Repton's village, only six, six years after he died, knew, had ever heard of him. But it was called Repton Cottage. 
And this is the only photograph we have of Repton's cottage. It's now a grotesque um, glass and steel branch of Lloyd's Bank. And his garden is a car park. There we go. That's Essex for you, by the way. I don't know, I, I want to move on from the cottages back to my main theme, but just to show you that his ideas about the, the cottage, are, people are written, written, writing about them, writing down his ideas, and here is um, Andrew Jackson Downing publishing his book on cottages, and, it, and these are the cottages, and Repton's natural cottages, which you see in every street in England. Every suburb in England has semi, these semi-detached houses, this is what they look like. This sort of form, this is what an awful lot of American housing looks like. And it comes straight from this debate about uh, natural architecture, if you like. Um, so you, you can see these are, these are American, but they're just not a million miles away from, from Ainsley, for instance. You can see the same tradition. Um, and I now want to um, turn to, to my proof that the front door problem was a genuine problem, okay? Or if you're still with me. This is handily labeled by Capability Brown. It's a plan in 1768. This is Swinnerton. Here's the house. And in front of the house is a proposal to plant this belt. Um, and it comes closest to the house here, and then it fades away at the distance. And if you look at it today, so there's the view out. This is, I'm standing at the front door of the house. I'm looking straight out, and straight in front is this great clump. And on the one, one side, there's a view to Stafford Castle, and on the other side, there's a view to a great sort of natural um, cliff. So the point about this is that Brown is trying to say that, that we don't want a view out from the front door. We're not going to do that. We're going to block that view. And this clump is actually framing views from the windows on each side of the front door. This is a classical house, because that makes sense. If you have views on each side of the front door, then the front door doesn't have to be open. And so it's a landscape solution to, to the front door problem. And it's kind of it's counterintuitive, because you would think brown, wonderful open expanse in front of the house and so on. You'd think that house, that wasn't there, but I have I'm going to show you a few more examples just to hammer it home, just how peculiar it is, and once you start to notice it, how you see it all the time. So this is Claremont, another classical house designed by Brown, very much a barrack. You can see what I mean about his, well, shortcomings as an architect, perhaps. Um, but if we look at a plan, this one's slightly out of focus, but here's the house, and here, right in front of it, is a cedar tree which is now gone, but is remembered as a great stump right bang in front of the house, a single tree dividing the view. And here, as, as uh, Kirtlington, here's the house, here's Brown's pleasure ground, and a single tree, again, blocking the view out. And if we look at, um, and then there's several, lots of examples where these still survive today, amazingly. So this is Milton Abbey. My all in all, it's my favorite brown landscape. It's Milton Abbas, the village is all part of it. This is the abbey, and if you stand, this is the, um, we're looking at the north front, but if we stand at the west front, right in the middle of the window, straight off, is, is a lime tree breaking the view. And, um, and I'm just going to show you one more, because you can understand I've made a kind of obsessive collection of these examples, but Warder is another one. So this is a designer called Jasper Conran lives, who's quite well known in England. And if you stand in the middle of his house, in the middle of the window, and look straight out, five miles away, you see this clump of beech trees on top of Milbury Down, five miles away. But it, it, has, the, it has the impact of once you are reading the landscape, which means looking at it intelligently rather than just uh, saying, gosh, what a nice view, do you know what I mean? You, you can see that it falls into two parts. And here, this is the South Hill, the South Terrace, with a dramatic, it's quite a dramatic fall on that side. And here, covered in alder trees and not really showing up, is the lake, the main lake. So you have a landscape that divides into two which are, one is a kind of counterpart of the other. On the one hand, the hill, on the other hand, the lake, divided by the single tree. 
And um, this is obviously a, a trope of Italian painting, is it not? Um, with the single tree and um, military virtue on one side and um, peace and so on on the other. And this is Scipio's dream. And strangely, Brown and Scipio had the same motto. Brown's motto is also uh, never less alone than when alone. To what extent this, this collision between pictures, painting, and landscape is accidental, and to what extent it was something Brown had picked up, I, I really don't know. So one thing you can do, Burley House is a good example, is make sure that you never see the whole building. This is a way of, you can, so from looking out from the building, you want this symmetry, which is why you may want to block the front door view and have views to each side. But looking in, you don't want to see necessarily anything that's symmetrical or complete at all. So when you go along the drive, here's the lake is in the foreground here, but when you go along the drive, the house keeps coming and going from the view and you never see the whole house all in one go. And even more famously at Blenheim Palace, Brown's masterpiece, um, here's the enormous palace. Wherever you go around the brown grounds on Brown's drives, you never see the whole thing. You just keep seeing different bits as if it's different it's one huge symmetrical rock building, but it's, uh, you're constantly seeing different parts of it as if it's a dozen different buildings that keep cropping up when you least expect it going around the landscape. Um, so that's one thing you can do. Another thing Brown loves to do, this is Luton. And this, these steps and this garden here is actually later. So set that to one side. But he, can you see he's dug a valley an artificial valley here rising up to the house. So instead of the house being on a flat, he puts a valley in front of it so the house appears to be on a bit of a plinth, on a bit of a slope. And he does this again and again as a way of... And, and, and the valley is always never square onto the house. It's running away at an angle, like at a slight diagonal, so that you get this constant change of slope context. Con context as, slope and shadow contrast. And um, going on famously to Repton, um, Repton was faced with this monster of a house at Welbeck Abbey, um, and his answer was to bury it. Do you see, it's suddenly got three stories up to the gable, and it's suddenly two. Um, and he, <coughs> Repton was quite famous for burying houses. Because houses, particularly those ones like Brown, they tend to stand up so high off the ground. Um, because by the time you've got in the servants' quarters and everyone else's quarters into the ground, they tend to be four or five stories high. And so burying for Repton was quite a good treatment for a classical type house. And here, here's the other front. And again, you can see the three becoming two. Do you see what I mean? <laughs> he was very proud of this burying trick, and he did it did it quite a bit. Um, and so just to finish, um, these cottages were built at Welbeck in, in the 1830s. They were definitely based on Repton's designs of 1793, much earlier. And funnily enough, they have an awful lot of the detail I've been talking about in, a, in miniature, like the portico, the grand room upstairs, and they, and they are essentially um, vernacular in that it's, they're not struggling to be picturesque, do you see what I mean? Um, so that's what I have to say, I think. Thank you. <laughs>